All right, today's lecture is on the irreducibility of the moduli space of curves. And, uh, but, but first, let's, let's recap where we are, right? The whole, the whole course is targeted on proving this theorem. And we know everything but uh, irreducibility and uh, projectivity. And so these are the contents. The irreducibility we'll cover today and projectivity we'll, sort of we'll summarize on, on Monday. Um, and maybe this comes with a, a caveat that at least for the properness, we only prove properness in characteristic zero, right? We didn't, it, it is true more generally, it's true over Z and we'll actually use it. Uh, so today, one of the ideas is we'll use properness actually over Z to imply uh, irreducibility in characteristic P. But okay, so yeah, today's outline, uh, today's, today's goal is to, is to cover irreducibility. And, and let me just summarize like the, the, the overall outline of today's lecture. So there's, there's four parts and we're gonna begin on sort of just a summary and a background on, on branch covers, uh, like branch covers of like of smooth curves C mapping to, to P1. And uh, we're covering this because this is an important feature in a number of these arguments. So namely in the argument two, three, and in Fulton's argument here, use, use the concept of branch covers. And if you remember back to the very first lecture, I, uh, I was sort of emphasizing kind of that branch covers are an important way to think about smooth curves. They give you a handle on this geometry. And we, we sort of, we, we, we even summarized Riemann's uh, argument using branch covers that the dimension of, that the dimension of MG was 3G minus three. And so it'll feature again today in a very important way. And so the, the first argument um, I'll, be, I'll give sort of a, a topological one uh, or at least there's some topological ingredients and dating back to the 19th century. So it's due to Klepsch and, and Hurwitz. And so this is a characteristic zero argument that does have some non-algebraic input. Uh, and then the next argument we'll give is sort of uh, an argument appearing in Fulton's appendix to this Harrison Mumford's paper on admissible covers, namely the, the, the paper on the Kodair dimension of MG and this has the advantage of its characteristic zero and completely algebraic. Uh, and right, so that the third argument will be Fulton's uh, appendix. Uh, and then I'll, I'll try to summarize sort of uh, some irreducibility arguments. And from 1969, there are these two papers, one by Delina Mumford where they, they presented two arguments proving the irreducibility of MG and then Fulton's paper appearing in the same year, they all, um, this all, so these methods, these are valid in characteristic P um, and they reduce, so they, they show it in, in characteristic P by reducing to characteristic zero. And in Fulton's case, it only works if the, if the, the degree, uh, if the prime is lar larger than the genus or G plus one. So for, for primes sufficiently large. Uh, right, so we're gonna cover these three arguments, but I, like if you note, I'm first covering the classical 19th, 19th century argument, and then I'll go, uh, I'm gonna cover first this the Fulton's appendix, because I think it's, it's, it's sort of more, it's, it's, it builds on a lot of ideas introduced in Delina Mumford's paper, as well as Fulton's 1969 paper, but I, I feel I feel like it's the most conceptual. It's, a, it's also completely algebraic and characteristic zero. So I'll present that, and then I'll just at the end summarize uh, these these arguments from 1969. Uh, but I do do want to highlight that sort of that compactifications play a, a crucial role in uh, these arguments. These these arguments exploit the compactification. Jared, can I, can I, can I, 
because I have to leave early, I feel like I should have asked you this before, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, I've seen some of these, but maybe I never looked at some. I presume the argument in the end was just going to, is going to be philosophically, you take your curve and you want to show you can break it. And as long as you can break it all the way down to um, uh, trivalent genus zero uh, and the entire space is smooth and you can connect all of those, then you win. Is that, is that most- Yeah, that's exactly right. So th this is why, you, like, why the compactification plays a role. Like maybe I'll just, I'll draw a little, like a, a, a picture maybe with this like cartoon picture with what, what the argument uh, Ravi was trying to explain. So this is MG, it's not compact, right? You have like uh, smooth curves in here. Uh, and what we've, what we've done already with stable curves is compactified it. So you have this boundary consisting of singular curves. So these are our singular curves on the boundary. And the idea is sort of to show that that you can degenerate to the boundary. You, you, pick, you, you pick your favorite smooth curve and, and you, you show that you can sort of degenerate it to the boundary. So if someone else picks another curve, you can also degenerate that to the boundary. And then the goal is to show that the boundary is connected. And so you kind of can further to, to, to connect, connect those points. And so that's, yeah, I think that, that, that I mean, yeah, this is, that's the, the, the crucial reason why compactifications and, uh, are, are useful here, because it allows us yeah, to, to, to connect them by, by breaking. Uh, right. And, and right, and so the, the, one of the, the struggles in these arguments is showing, in fact, that this works, that you can, that you can degenerate a smooth curve to a, a singular stable curve, right? And that's what, that's, that, that this is the, the main feature of the, the third argument I'll be given. Any other questions on like the outline or before I begin? Yes, is MG reducible? I, sorry, I, I missed the. Is missed MG it. without the. Oh, yes, MG is. Is, is MG reducible? Yes, MG itself is irreducible. I'll, I'll comment on kind of the equivalences in, in, in a second. In fact, that's the first thing I want to say. It's a good question. We'll see. Uh, actually, I also wanted to preface this lecture by saying that you know I'm not really an expert in, in in these irreducibility arguments. These are all very classical. You know, some dating back to 1872. And all of these, but I have spent some time over the last week reading these papers, and I also benefited immensely from a conversation with Eric Larson. And so this is just for what it's worth my attempt to summarize these irreducibility arguments. Right. So, right, the goal is to show that MGN is irreducible. And so my first remark is that because the stack is smooth and in particular normal, it's equivalent to showing that it's connected. And uh, since, you know, MGN bar is, uh, yeah, is a family of curves over and, and, and or, yeah, that you can reduce the connectedness of MGN bar to the, the connectedness of MG bar because of, uh, well, we have these maps between them and they all have connected fibers. And then, so yeah, and then to relate this to the connectedness or, or, or irreducibility of MG itself. So to show that MG bar is connected, it's the same as knowing that MG is connected and that it's dense in MG bar. And so all of these statements in remark one have been uh, uh, at the stack level, but we also have a course modulized space. Uh, and if you take that, then, all, then because these course modulized spaces identify the underlying topological spaces, uh, that all, all of, and, and these statements, the very nature of these statements are topological, uh, all these statements are equivalent to the corresponding statements on the course modulized space. Right, and over here, I sort of wanted to emphasize why do we care? I mean, to me, this is one of the most important results in the moduli theory of, of curves because like, it tells us that because MG is connected, the genus is the only discrete invariant. So it's sort of, this is obvious, but it rules out like M, MG 
looking like, you know, having multiple components consisting of smooth curves. I mean, I think in the very beginning, like the genus was our first invariant. And in the case of curves, you sort of get lucky that it's, it's the only invariant. Uh, and the second statement that, you know, so that's on the connectedness of MG, the fact that MG is dense in MG bar is sort of, is sort of a, a statement that there's no, um, there's no component of MG bar consisting entirely of singular curves. So it sort of rules out having maybe, uh, or maybe this is your MG, but it, and it rules out like maybe having some, like having a boundary here and then perhaps an entire component consisting of singular curves. And because we know it's smooth, it also sort of rules out the, the case where, you know, that these sort of intersect where there's like an irreducible co component of MG. Um, so we know that, yeah. So it rules out like having an entire component consisting of singular curves. And so I, the, the arguments I'm gonna summarize, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize algebraic approaches, even though like the first one, which is probably the most conceptual intuitive one is has a, well, has one non-algebraic ingredient. Uh, and of course there are many other arguments and I'm not trying to give sort of systematic uh, summary of like other topological or an analytic arguments. Like there, you can also use the Teichmuller space, for instance, to, to uh, get at the irreducibility. Right, but the important ingredient in a number of these arguments is, is uh, using the theory of, of branch covers. So I'm gonna, about the first part component of this lecture is gonna be an intro introduction to, to branch covers. Okay, so a branch cover of P1 uh, is, a, is the data of a smooth and connected, it's connected, smooth and connected curve together with a finite map to, P, to P1. And often we let, we let D be the degree of F. And we, we, we uh, we're, yeah, in characteristic P, we want to rule out inseparable field extensions. So the function field is a separable finite extension of fields. And maybe the first remark is that, um, you know, this map F is a tau precisely where uh, is a tau, okay, maybe, yeah, at points P where the sheaf of differentials vanishes, the relative sheaf of differentials vanishes. And so this, this, this relative sheet of differentials controls where the map is not a tau, namely where it's ramified. And we say that F is ramified at a point P of index E if the, under, if the length um, of the localization of the sheet of differentials at P has length E minus one. Right, an example to keep in mind, uh, at least this is like, a, I'll just give the local example where you have maybe X being A1 mapping to A1 by X goes to X to the D. And if you just compute the differentials here of X over Y, you see that it's, if I have coordinates X is generated by, by uh, DX, but subject to the relation uh, that D times X to the D minus one DX is zero. And you see, so, yeah, so if the characteristic doesn't divide D, then you see that the length at this, uh, at this, at the origin is precisely D minus one. So this would be, this, this would have ramification index D. But note that in, in certain characteristics, this is, this is like the Frobenius map and it's, it's, uh, it's not tamely ramified. Right, and then this allows us, so we, we then use this relative sheaf of differentials to define the ramification divisor. Maybe you just take like it's, it's, it's a set theoretic, you take the support, and, but with the multiplicity of, of the length of the, of the ramification index.
Right, and then the natural sequence on differentials, you know, you always you have this short exact sequence here, and uh, like since we're on a curve, uh, and C and both C and P one are smooth, you know, this you get this. Um, these are these are just line bundles, and and you have the corresponding relation as as divisors. Right, and if you just take degrees of these divisors. Uh, you get you get Riemann Hurwitz. So this is it, again d is going to be the degree of f, and so just computing the the degree of omega c is two g minus two, where g is the genus of c, and therefore this is identified with uh, the degree of the pullback of the sheaf of differentials. So you get you multiply the, the degree of omega on P1 by D. Whoops. So this is D times minus two, and then plus the ramification divisor R. And so the, you get that the degree of R is 2D plus 2G minus two. And this is the content of Riemann Hurwitz. All right, and then moving on, we don't want, we want to restrict to, to particularly nice branch covers. So we want it to, to, to consider simply branch covers. So yeah, in the next slide I introduce, so we call a branch covering simply branched if every ramification index is two, if every ramification point yeah, has index two and that there's, that there's at, at most one ramification point in every fiber. So here's, here's this, is, uh, this is a picture of something simply branched, where you look at that the, the ramification points here are over distinct points in P1, and they're all just double, doubly branched. <clears throat> but these examples at the bottom, these are not simply branched, right? Because you have, here you have two ramification points over the same point, and here you have a ramification index of, of three. Right, so in, in, in if you have a simply branch covering, then uh, then then Riemann Hurwitz implies that a, like a simply branch covering is ramified over this number, this, this which I'm calling B, two D plus two D minus two distinct points in P1. And so it's, yeah, so this is yeah, my yeah, so it's, it seems like a nice notion. Uh, but we need we need to show that uh, that that smooth curves have simply branch coverings. So this is the content of the first lemma that there's is that every curve. Yeah, yeah. The content is I take a smooth projective connected curve of genus G and a line bundle of sufficiently high degree. You can make the bound explicit if you if you yeah if if, if you want. And then the statement is that for a general subspace, two dimensional subspace of the sections of L that the induced map defined by this linear series is, is simply branched. Uh, and the argument, I, I won't go through it in full detail, but it's, it's just a dimension count, right? Because you, 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 you look at, so you know that the, by Riemann Rock, uh, you know that the, uh, that the dimension of global sections of, of L is d plus one minus g, and so therefore, the, the, the subspace of two, the, the Grassmannian of two planes in this vector space has dimension 2d minus g minus 1. And so the strategy is to show that if v, if this linear series is not simply branched, then, the, the, then it fails. The conditions saying that it fails to be simply branched are, are going to be uh, lower dimensional. Right? So what we need to show is that if if, if the cover is not simply branched, then, well, then we know either there's a base point or there's a ramification point of index greater than two, or there's two ramification points in the same fiber. So each of these needed need to be treated separately. Maybe, uh, yeah, uh, I'll just explain quickly why um, B is a, is a, the condition of B is a, is, has code, like is a, yeah, it has, a, has smaller dimension. So let's just look at case B. 
So in, in this case, uh, there's going to be a ramification index, a point with ramification index at least uh, three. So there exists a section in V uh, such that S actually vanishes to order three at some point. And therefore, if you want to compute the dimension of subspaces V in the Grassmannian, such that this map given by P satisfies B, we can compute this as the dimension. So we want to look at, we, we need one section or vanishing to order three. So let's, let's just view it up to scalar. So projectivize this space. And then you need one other section uh, and maybe up to scaling if you, of in the, in the quotient. Of, of, a, of a given section here. So, and, and then if you do this dimension count using Riemann rock, you just compute that this is, so this, this dimension using Riemann rock, uh, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll cheat. I have it written here. D minus three plus, and this is D minus G and then minus one. And then if you compute this, this is, this is 2D minus 2G minus four, which is strictly less than two DG minus one. Right, and then for the for cases A and C, you argue argue similarly. You just compute the dimension of, of that condition, and you show it's less than the Grassmannian. So this gives us the existence of simply branched covers, sort of the starting point for these arguments. <clears throat> Jared, I thought in characteristic two there weren't simply branched covers. Do you know if this goes wrong somewhere, or if I'm misremembering? Because I thought they were always wildly ramified. Right, I don't remember. I mean. Mm, I don't remember. I, I need this in characteristic zero, but I'm not. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure okay. if this breaks down a positive characteristic. Also, let me just, argument, just add this. Oh. Yeah, I, I, let me add a characteristic zero assumption here. That's a fair question. Also, at just at the end of this argument is the. Do you really want that if you like added one to the left hand side, it's still less than the right hand side because like the point could be anywhere on the curve? Oh, uh, oh, right. Yeah, good point. And I like, I guess we're lucky here. Yeah, because this is actually two less, yeah. right? Because the point could be any. Okay. Yeah, Hannah wants me to add a minus one here because the point adds a curve. Yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions, corrections? Okay, so, so on the next slide, I, I have other important, yeah, some uh, other, other properties, simply branch covers. The first is that uh, is that simply branch covers, if the degree is greater than two, have no automorphisms, meaning that there's no automorphisms of C over P1. And the, I mean, I'm not going to spell it out completely, but the reason is that you know an automorphism. Over P1 would fix the branch points. the 2D plus 2G minus two branch points. And there's just a, a fact, classical fact about curves, smooth curves, is that there does not exist any non-trivial aughts uh, fixing more than 2G plus two points. And so as long as D is greater than two, yeah, there won't be any automorphisms. Not such an that's not such an important fact for, for this lecture, but I just wanted to, to state it. 
Um, but it does, uh, it does allow us to define, so I'm going to look at now the, the moduli space of all simply branch covers. I define that as H D little b. So little d is the degree, little b is the number of branch points. And there's a relationship between, yeah, b, the genus, and the degree. And so we can define this either as a topological space or because there's no automorphisms as an, as an algebraic space. And uh, sort of the important point here is that there's maps, uh, that this maps both to MG and to the symmetric product of P1, where here, if I'm, if I'm given a, a, a simple branch covering, I just forget the covering, I can map it to C, or I can map to the B branch points. So this is here, this is, the, this is the locus. I'm taking the symmetric product because I don't want to have the points ordered. These are B unordered distinct points. And yeah, this, this is bijective to the projective space of dimension B moving the discriminant hy hypersurface. Um, and so, yeah, so. So if you're just interested in this, this Herwood space as a topological space, uh, you, can, you can use this to define the topology on, on HTP. Uh, right, and, and what we want to do, what we want to know is that, that, that this map is, is finite and, and a tau. So in characteristic zero, this is the third lemma. Here I did add the characteristic zero hypothesis, yeah. Uh, is that this map is, is, a, is, is finite in, in a tau. In other words, this map is, is a covering space. And uh, the reason we care about this is that, you know, the, the first lemma implies that, the first lemma we, we, we proved implies that there exists a simply branch covering of C. But now because this map is finite in, in a tau, as I deform the B onward points, I could deform the curve with it. So what this lemma will allow us to do is to, to show the lemma implies um, that, there, that, it, that there exists that, let me write it this way, that any C to P1 can be deformed so that the branch locus is, is general. Right, and so let me just give, give you a hint of, of these ideas. I mean, there's two, there's, you can approach it topologically or algebraically. And I'm, I'm gonna prove the talentness, I'll skip the finiteness, which is treated, not, yeah, not, not yeah. Just gonna, yeah, I'll just, yeah, I won't, yeah. It, that, it, so, yeah, there's an argument I'm gonna give later, which is essentially the, the finiteness argument. But so topologically, uh, so we have our, we have in this picture here, an example of a simply branch covering. And what we need to show is that if, if I wiggle these points around then I can wiggle the, the cover as well. So let's suppose that I have a point here, Q, Q1, and I'm, and I'm just moving P1. I'm just gonna do the argument for one point. I move P1 a little bit to this point Q1 and I wanna show that I could deform the cover but and this is all topological, so I can, I can sort of take an open disk around these points. I guess that, oops. And then looking at in an open neighborhood. And then, and then I, could, I could just move this cover to another point. And then, and then I, 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 I form the global cover just by, by realizing, you know, like a, a way uh, 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 over other opens here, this is just the trivial cover. So I just glue back this, the, I, I, to create the purple curve, I, I can just glue it to the, um, yeah, to the complement because I, I, yeah, it's, it's topologically trivial. Is this okay? I mean, it's much easier than the algebraic argument because, yeah. <laughs> yeah.
And so algebraically, what we need to show is that, you know, that they have, uh, that, and that there's a bijection between, say, first order deformations of, of the cover and of the points in P1. Um, in other words, you know, this is, this is the induced map on tangent spaces of, of this cover. And, and since they're both smooth to show that this map is a tau, it suffices actually to show that, yeah, that it induces a bijection on tangent spaces, or in other words, these yeah, first order deformation spaces. And on the right hand side, right, these are just B, dis whoops, these are just B distinct points in P1. So this is B dimensional. And uh, I'm just going to compute the dimension of this space. So this, this space you can show deformations are classified by sections of the normal sheaf to F, where if you look at that, if you look at the pullback map of you know, the tangent sheaf of C mapping to the pullback, of the tangent sheaf on P1, and then I'm just, NF is just the quotient. And so to get at the dimension of, of this vector space, I, I look at the corresponding long exact sequence and H0 of TC vanishes because yeah, the, uh, the genus is greater than two, is greater than one. So I get a map from H, so this induces a short exact sequence of vector spaces from H0 of the pullback of P1 to H0 of NF to H1 of TC. And actually, you know, this is this sort of has an interesting interpretation in terms of deformation theory. Like this middle term is deformations of the cover. This maps, if I just forget the cover, um, we already know this classifies deformations of C. And so this is the this this map here is the forget from map from the covers to the, the curve. And meanwhile, this is sort of the kernel. This is this is deformations that um, of of sort of the map with that that fix the source and the target. And so computing the dimensions of these, we, this we already computed with Riemann rock. This is 3G minus 3. Here, Riemann rock implies that um, the tangent bundle on P1 is O of 2. So that has degree 2. I pull it back by F, so it has degree 2D. So therefore, the, the, by Riemann rock, it's 2D plus a 1 minus G. And if you add these up, you get, you get B. And so at least this shows that maybe you should expect that it be bijective. There's more work involved in showing it, yeah, to show that this map actually induces this, this bijection. I'm just trying to give you a, a hint at these arguments. So the second map in the short exact sequence, is that just the tangent map uh, from the Horowitz space to MG? Yes. Okay, so that yes. shows that that map is smooth. Oh, yes, for instance, yeah. Uh, right, yeah. Mm. Is Wait, I, this, this, okay, what, what I can say, say is that, oh, that, that was the eraser. What I can say is that this, this is, that this is the induced map on tangent spaces. of to mg, right. Uh, and you want to say that because it's surjective, that map is also smooth. Oh. I'm putting this on YouTube, so I'm, let, me not, let, me, <laughs> let me move on. We can discuss it at the end. <laughs> Are we making some assumption about um, d being large? I am assuming d is sufficiently large, yes. OK. Yeah, I'm always taking D to be sufficiently large. Yeah. Are there other other concerns here? Okay, let, let me tell you that. Okay, so this is this is this completes what I wanted to say about the background of simply branch covers. Let me try to explain how this is then used to get irreducibility with the Klebsch-Hurwitz proof. 
Okay. So here the references, yeah, are uh, Klepsch's paper, Hurwitz's paper, and then there's uh, in Fulton's 1969 paper, which we'll get to later, he also gives sort of a modern, modern treatment of, of these proofs. And ultimately, you know, his proof is in, in positive characteristic relies on the characteristic zero statement. So he had, there's an, you can read about it in that paper too. Um, so there's one, the one, one result we need that's in a non-algebraic is um, the Riemann existence theorem. And we'll need it in this, in this following form that, that there are bijections between algebraic branch covers, topological and, and holomorphic. Right, and maybe it should be clear, it should be obvious that like, okay, any algebraic cover gives you a topological one, same with any holomorphic. But, uh, but if you're given a topological branch covering, you can use that to define a holomorphic structure on C, inducing it from the holomorphic structure on P1. So it's not hard to see that these are actually equivalent. So sort of the content of this in the hard direction is that holomorphic coverings are, are algebraic. Right, and, and we'll also need the following ingredient from topology of, we'll, we'll, need to, we'll, we'll look at the monodrome reaction. So let me explain quickly, even though that may be familiar to many of you. Uh, so I, I, I take a curve, and so then, uh, yeah, and I let B and P1 be the branch locus. So that's the, the red points down here. And, uh, and let's take a point Let's take a point P downstairs and a pre-image Q. And so that, and, uh, and note that, you know, like my picture is, is one dimensional, but you know, the P1 over C is a two dimensional. So I, let, me, let, me, let me view it two, as a two dimensional surface. And, and then I, I, what I'm gonna do is take loops around. So let's take a loop starting at P going around here, gamma. So gamma is an element of the fundamental group of P1 of C minus the branch locus based at P. And uh, since this is a covering outside B, you know, you can lift this path gamma to, to C. And if you trace, uh, you can, then you can trace Q under the lifting of this path, right? What that gives you is like, if you think about this, it just goes up. And maybe it lands here, Q prime. So if you, so tracing points in, in the fiber under lifts of, of, of a cover gives you, gives you um, another point, right? This is Q prime. So in other words, what we have is a map from the fundamental group or we have an action, whoops, whoops. We have, we have an action on, on the fiber, F inverse of P. All right, and this fiber consists of right, D elements. And, and the action explicitly is just gamma times Q is Q prime. Well, another way to say this is that, you know, we have a group homomorphism because every group element just permutes the fibers. You have a map to the symmetric group on fibers, SD. It's called this row. This is a group homomorphism. And we also know exactly what the fundamental group is. I mean, this is a fundamental group calculation that I could do. <laughs> this is uh, just generated by loops around each of the branch points. And since it's P1, you know, you, ha you have to add the relation that this is, is one, where here sigma i is a, it's just a simple loop. around the i point in B. And then an important fact about the, this bijection between um, coverings and, and maps from the fundamental group to the symmetric group is, is this, is that C is connected um, if and only if the image of rho in SD is a transitive subgroup. And keep in mind in our definition of branch coverings and of simply branch coverings, 
the curve is connected. But under, but under this, cor this correspondence works more generally. And if you think maybe about the extreme case where you have a trivial covering where so it's completely disconnected, you know, then this fundamental group, then this map uh, group homomorphism row maps onto the identity. But, but and so, but it, yeah, this is not, yeah, not hard to see that this, this correspondence. But are we just considering C to be smooth? Yeah, C is smooth here. Just yes. Last Okay, because in the picture it is not. Yeah, oh, oh, right. No, in the, yeah, that's a good. Okay, no, no. C is smooth. Even in the picture, it's smooth. C is smooth. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah, it has sync. This map has. Yeah, uh, like it. Yeah, we 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 uh, arrived at this issue before. Like, I'm drawing it like this, but it, it, there's not a singularity here. This is just I'm drawing. This picture is, is drawn as an illustration of the map, not really of the curve. It's the same of like, think about the map A1 to A1 where like X goes to X squared. Thank you. But yeah, so far everything, everything C is smooth in this whole story here. Right, and so, yeah, so the, the, the upshot of this is that we have this nice conclusion that uh, for any subset B, these are the branch points, so, Capital B is always the branch locus, little b is the number of points. And so we have a bijection between branch covers and group homomorphism such that the image is transitive. Yeah, right. And maybe to be, so here these, by the Riemann existence theorem, you could take these to be algebraic or topological. And uh, let's see, to be precise, this equivalence is up to inner automorphism. It's not so important for today's lecture, but yeah, it's up to like up to inner autom automorphism that, that is conjugation by elements of SD, right? Two group homomorphisms are equivalent if you can conjugate by SD. And this morphism restricts, so we have this bijection. And if you look at the locus of simply branch covers, this maps then bijectively to ones where the condition that it's simply branched, that is that there's only um, ramification index two, translates, if you think about it, to the condition that the image of these simple loops, sigma i, in SD are transpositions. All right, so I think we now have the background to cover the Klepsch Hurwitz proof. Uh, but yeah, I'll pause for a second. Okay. So let me. So this, this picture here reminds us what we have. Um, and our, our goal is to prove this theorem here, that the Hurwitz space is connected over the complex numbers. Right, and uh, by, uh, I think it was the first lemma, we proved, the first lemma proved that this map was surjective, right? That every curve, as long as you take here D, D is always sufficiently large, then every curve uh, is admits a simple, simple, simply branch cover. So this map is, is surjective. Uh, and this implies that um, because this map is surjective, the image of something connected is also connected. So this irreducibility of the Hurwitz space gives us that uh, the connectedness of the Hurwitz space gives us the connectedness of MG. All right, and so I'll, I'll walk you through this proof here. So I'm just sort of recapping things we've already known here. So first we know, we know the fundamental group of the complement of the branch locus is, has this explicit description. And here to remind you, sigma i is a simple loop around i point. And, uh, and we also have seen that the fundamental group 
acts on the fibers of a branch covering, that is, it, yeah, this is simply branched over, over B, the fundamental group of P1 minus B acts on that fiber. And similarly, we've shown that this morphism I've called beta upstairs is also a finite in a tau cover. So for the same reason, you have this monodromy action of the fundamental group of the complement. Uh, so it's the fundamental group of the complement of the discriminant locus. Uh, and it acts on the fibers of this map. So that's just for notation. Let's introduce this terminology here. So I'm defining HD capital B to be the fiber under beta. So yeah, maybe here in this picture upstairs, we have B and its fiber is HD capital B. And right, so yeah, so HD little b is the union over all of its fibers. And, and so, uh, yeah, so what I'm, I'm trying to get at here is to, to looking at a reinterpretation of what this fiber is. So by definition, it's the inverse of, of capital B. This corresponds to covers that are simply branched over capital B. And we've seen on that previous slide that this corresponds to group homomorphisms, such that the image is a transitive subgroup and such that each, such that the image of each of these simple loops is a transposition. So this gives us this, this, this useful combinatorial description of this fiber. So we could think this map is determined by the image of these simple loops, the transpositions. So we have the locus of B simple transpositions. Sorry, B, yeah, transpositions and, and, and their product needs to be one. And we're after the connectedness of this Hurwitz space, and this is equivalent to the transitivity of the action of the fundamental group on this fiber. So this gives us now a combinatorial strategy to prove connectedness. And so I've tried to explain this over here. So what we, what we wanna do, we wanna show that this action is transitive. So we, we're just gonna like cook up explicit loops in, in this space that act in a prescribed way on B uh, ordered transpositions. Uh, and, and, and namely, there's like a particular uh, ordered set of transpositions here that will show that every element can be moved to. Let's just, let's call this guy tau star. So, so by constructing enough, yeah, enough loops and playing around, we'll, we'll move any element in the fiber to this guy. All right, so the, how do we do this? So here, here's my picture. Um, so I'm gonna define a, a loop capital gamma i from zero, one, two, the unordered points, distinct points in P1, where what I'm gonna do is all I wanna do is swap the i and the i plus one point. So I, I'm, I'm gonna choose paths gamma i and gamma i prime, not intersecting so that they go, yeah, uh, in, that, in those directions. And then I define this, uh, a loop in the space of the unordered points by a fix so that the first i minus one don't move, and then I just ex uh, exchange the i i and the i plus one. Okay, and then what you need to check. Okay, here is I'm not going to give all these details. Yeah, these details. But you check two things. One, you you check that this action, if I act by gamma i on transpositions tau one to tau b, it has the effect of fixing the first i minus one. And then it conjugates the i plus one guy by i. And then the i plus first guy, it, it, it sort of switches I plus, the i plus one transposition and the i transposition, but it conjugates one of them, tau i, and then tau i, and then tau i plus two, and so on. I think that's right. And then, you, and, then the, and then it boils down to the following combinatorial problem is you need to check that you can, you could by applying gamma i's in the right order, 
in some order can move. You need to show that you can move any, you know, transposition, sequence of transpositions to this particular one tau star. And that's sort of just a combinatorial problem. But I hope this gives you a flavor of the argument. Any questions? And um, is there a generalization of this using etal a fundamental group? Yeah, I think you, I think you could probably make this. Uh, uh, yeah. I'll, uh, you want to just translate this argument and using the algebraic fundamental group uh, to get like sort of an algebraic proof uh, on the same uh, same ideas. Uh, yeah, I, I would suspect so. OK, thank you. Did your uh, transitivity of the subgroup uh, get lost in the, uh, you have that highlighted set at the bottom? Oh, good, yeah, good point. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I do need to add that condition, you're right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and that must come up in this, yeah, that, and that must come up in, uh, in this argument too. You need to check that, yeah, that they generate uh, yeah, that they generate uh, the transitive. Thank you, John. Yeah, let's add that condition. More simply, why are they transpositions? Is it just well, I think the the idea is that uh, because it's a simply branched cover, uh, like if you had a different type of branching here, like like uh, like in these cases, this would be the, 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 it would be like a product of two transpositions, and here it might be a three cycle. Um, but you have to, yeah. I think you just have to check that directly. I don't have any other words of wisdom. Okay, so I'm now going to give, so this was characteristic zero, relying on the Riemann existence theorem, but now I'm going to give a fully algebraic argument in characteristic zero. And then at the end, I'll, I'll summarize how you can get the characteristic P statements. And so this is this nice idea using the boundary that appears as an application of Harrison Mumford's admissible covers. And so in their 1982 paper, um, yeah, beautiful paper where their, their goal in the end was to compute the entire dimension of MG, but they introduced a number of other interesting ideas along the way, namely admissible covers. Uh, so yeah, it's a completely algebraic argument in characteristic zero. And the key proposition that the main challenge for us is to show that every smooth curve degenerates to a singular stable curve. You know, in other words, you know, there, if, if, if you have like, um, you know, there exists a, a family of curves, maybe a curve T and a map from T to MG bar such that maybe T maps to C. This is your, maybe your given smooth curve And what, what you want to construct is a, a curve T and a map to MG bar such that zero, or such that there's a point mapping to some C zero, which is a singular stable curve. So like here T is, is, is one dimensional, you have a family of curves, maybe the C is, this is your given smooth curve and you want to show that you can degenerate it to something singular. Right, that's our goal. That's our first goal. And then, then we'll use the boundary in a fundamental way to get at the irreducibility of MG bar. Um, 
right? And so we're going to use the theory of branch covers, namely these first two lemmas. The first lemma was just that there exists simply branch coverings for a given smooth curve C. And the, the third was that they, that, um, that they can be deformed, right? So on the right-hand side, I'm, I'm sketching the proof of this, of this key proposition. So we're given a smooth curve C. And the first lemma tells us that there is some simply branch covering of C. So we take, yeah, we take C to start and we, we cook up a simple branch covering. And then, um, okay, and now let's just choose an ordering of the branch points, arbitrary choice of ordering P1 to PB. And so this defines a B pointed curve, capital B, um, genus zero, right? Yeah, genus zero. And uh, so I, I'm viewing B, this ordered set of points as, as a, a point in the moduli space of B ordered genus zero points. And basically, yeah, since I want to degenerate to a singular stable curve, um, lemma three allows me to deform this simple branch covering to arrange that the branch locus uh, is general. So I can assume B is, is, is general. And that allows me to deform the B, uh, oh, this, this B ordered points, um, this, yeah, to a particular nice genus zero uh, B pointed stable curve. So I, I B degenerates to, to this curve here. Um, so this is, this is a, um, so in other words, i.e. I, there exists a family of genus zero B pointed curves, stable curves Uh, I'll call it D over a DVR such that the generic fiber is B and the special fiber is uh, what is this special curve it was D zero. All right, this just looks like the de degeneration of like of, of, of B distinct points on P1 to this particular stable curve. Okay, so yeah, so maybe to summarize this picture, I've, I've, uh, moving on to the next slide, we have constructed a degeneration. So this is just to remind you what we what you are, where we were. Um, so this sort of explains where we are right now, this picture. Uh, we have a simply branch cover. So we had deformed our, our original curve so that the branch points were general. So we have a simply branch cover. C, C star is a smooth curve. And D, D star, this is, oh, this is what I was calling, I guess, B earlier, capital B. And, uh, and I've deformed the B ordered points so in, 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 the, in this picture here, I have my de degeneration of my the B distinct points to, uh, to this stable genus zero curve. And these green lines denote the sections. And I, I have a, a simple branch covering over the generic fiber. What's missing is the central fiber here. Right, so that's the first step is, is, uh, is to, is to uh, what you can do is you can just extend this, the simple branch covering by defining C to be the integral closure, like the normalization of OD uh, inside the, in the fraction field of, of uh, the family C star. And so what that gives is a family C over D And what we'd like to understand is, so maybe this, there, there's some, that gives us some curve inside here. And uh, we'd like to understand, yeah, that, that central fiber. And we'd like to understand the, the ramification locus of the, the central fiber mapping to this curve D zero. 
like or understand what's happening on, under this map in the central fibers. And so we'd like to understand, yeah, where is that map ramified? And so now we can use something that like uh, some, uh, some purity of the branch locus, which says that the branch locus um, in something smooth is always a divisor. So in other words, you cannot have sort of like isolated branch points. Uh, they're, they're all gonna be in the closure. Two things can happen. You can have branch, yeah, you can have things in the closure. You, you might have, you might have branch points over nodes because those aren't smooth points. Something's happening here. Yeah, and you, and you could also have it, it be branched, let me erase this. You could also have it be branched along an entire component of, of the central fiber. But if it's branched over an entire component, you could do a trick similar to what we did in the proof of stable reduction, where you you if it's if if it's branched over a single component, then it means like that fiber is um, is non-reduced. So you apply uh, essentially like Abiyankar's lemma, which is easy in characteristic zero, like uh, which is yeah the arg you you base change by t goes to t to the m, where m is is the the multiplicity of that component. You normalize. And then uh, you can arrange that the central that the central fiber is only ramified over nodes. And so what you need to check here, and this this requires some some details I'm not going to get into, is that the central fiber is indeed nodal. After you you, you do this process, it's reduced and nodal, and this so this gives you a family of nodal curves. This this is, yeah, that's kind of the outcome of. of this de degenerating these simply branch covers. And uh, right, so but now we have a family of nodal curves. Note that if C0 is stable, we're done. Um, right, because if, if it's a stable curve, you know, then uh, because it maps to a union of a bunch of P1s, it cannot possibly be smooth, right? Because, yeah, it would have, you have to have, has, has, would have to have multiple components and they have to intersect in nodes. But otherwise, Uh, you can take the stable model. Because we want a degeneration to a stable singular curve. You could always degenerate to some non-stable singular curve. But yeah, yeah, we want a state. So we take the stable model just by contracting all the rational tails and rational bridges. And we need to check that this central fiber uh, is not smooth. And, and the, the idea is, okay, let's let T be an irreducible component of C0, not its stabilization, but the, 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 the central fiber itself, it's an irreducible component. This is the one that's mapping to our D0. This is the disjoint, this is the, yeah, the, the collection of P1s downstairs. And so this, the image, since T is connected, uh, it maps to some P1 inside here. And now we apply Riemann Horowitz to, to this cover. Riemann Horowitz tells us that two times the genus of T minus two equals the degree times minus two plus the ramification locus. And there's two things that can happen depending on where you're, um, which P1 it is, right? Like maybe in the first case, like if, P1 is a tail, meaning like if it's a tail, meaning like it could be this one, then there's only one node and then there's two branched points, like two, yeah, two of the green lines intersecting it. And so we know that the ramification is less than or equal to 
two plus, it could be fully ramified over in the node, D minus one. And in the second case, if it's a bridge, so that is it, maybe it's this middle guy here, then there's only one section, but there's made two nodes where it can be fully ramified. But actually in either case, like this is the, this is the, the um, this is the greater number here. So you get that, let's see, two, G minus two is less than or equal to minus two D plus one plus two D minus one. And what this calculation, if you do this right, let's see, this is minus one here. Yeah, and, and yeah, what you, it forces the genus of T to be zero. So I, yeah, so maybe I'll finish in this little box here. So this implies every component of T is a P1. And that implies that like the stabilization of it is nodal. And, and, and yeah, that's what we want. Like we said, yeah, yeah. There are other ways to make this argument work, but this was sort of a nice, particularly a nice degeneration to a very, to, yeah, to a curve where we can just, where Riemann Hurwitz sort of simply shows that, uh, that the stable limit is, is not smooth. Any questions on this? Are you using that M zero B bar is connected to find this degeneration? Uh, yes, yes. I'm yeah. I'm using the understanding of the boundary of, of M zero B bar, right? And and using yeah, using the fact that yeah that there that, that the analogous question of degenerating to a, a singular stable curve there is much easier because it's just everything's on P one. You could just let the sections collide, they blow up, and you could just explicitly exhibit it. Exactly. Yeah, P1 is much easier than an arbitrary smooth genus G curve. And that's sort of why branch covers are, are so, uh, yeah, powerful. Anyway, so this only completes the, this degeneration argument. Let me complete the picture of showing you know, how the, the, the compactification and this result implies um, what we want. So. We've already shown this first proposition, every smooth curve degenerates to a singular stable curve. And now we need to show that the boundary, the next part is showing that the boundary is connected. And this is sort of a, a, a proof by induction. Recall that this like delta is what we were denoting this complement here, or I, yeah, I could define it as the complement. And this consists of singular curves which we had defined as, we defined these guys last time. And we call that de delta zero was the image, is the irreducible single singular curve of m g minus one two bar to m g bar. And then delta i was the image mg bar. And then by induction, we know, oops. by induction on the genus, we know each delta i is uh, irreducible. But we also know they intersect. Right, for each, for instance, like if I take a genus I curve and then a component and then a G minus, maybe this is a genus I, yeah, also has a genus J. So if I take this, this is in the intersection of delta I and, and delta J. And likewise, I could take a genus I component and then something like this. And then this would be in delta intersection of delta zero and delta I. So we see that these are, are non-empty. And this, this, this allows us uh, to conclude that mg bar is connected, right? Not, not maybe to, a sketch of why this works. I think uh, is that like if, if this is 
So basically, the picture I gave on the, in the first slide. This is mg. Uh, we have we have. So this is the locus of smooth curves on the boundary. You know, maybe here is delta. Oops, is delta zero here. And and sort of they intersect. Right? Maybe this is delta zero, delta one, and so on. And so the, the game you play is to show that the, the mg bar is connected. If you if you have any two curves, maybe c and a c prime, uh, you 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 apply the, the first proposition to degenerate it to the boundary. So maybe this goes to here, and then you degenerate c prime to the boundary. But now you know that that all of the components yeah they intersect, so you can degenerate further to here, and you get that mg bar is is is, is connected. But this argument actually shows more. Let me just tell you like what Deline, um, what, what Harris and Mumford were, were interested in. The limit that we constructed C0 mapping to D0 is what's called an admissible cover. So if you, if you do a careful analysis to see what kind of, what, what limits you get, what you get is something. It's 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 uh, what this means. So it, it, I guess you take it as a definition of an admissible cover is two things. So here d zero recall d zero is just is an m zero b bar. So it's it, it's a union of rational curves meeting in nodes, and so this this cover must must be um, simply branched away from the nodes. And then over the nodes, it could be it could be branched in, in, in not, yeah you, over the nodes. The branching has a prescribed form. It looks like the local calculation. It just looks like kind of a default cover of a node. I say x goes to x to the m, y goes to y to the m. But the upshot of this is it, it kind of gives you a, a, a nice way to complete this picture we had earlier uh, or compactify that picture we had, had earlier. Namely, we have uh, you, this, this you can define a stack of these admissible covers. Admissible covers. And this maps by forgetting the cover to mg bar. And on the other hand, it maps onto m0b bar. And this map is, 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 is finite, it's a subjective. And so this uh, kind of gives you a, a compactified picture of that diagram we're using earlier. And it's, it's sort of, yeah, it's sort of nice because if, if you play around with D uh, and you, you, can, you can define particularly nice loci in MG bar, and this was Harrison Mumford's uh, was, was goal was to define divisors in this way so that, uh, yeah, and then compute. Yeah, and then they actually computed the, the divisors in terms of other, uh, yeah, in terms of the boundary divisors, and then we're able to show that the canonical divisor was was big, and that therefore it, when G was sufficiently high, that it's general type. Anyway, here I'm just interested in the connectedness. So yeah, any questions on this? So I have a question. Um, so given two curves, if I want the base to be irreducible, can I find the, the family in which the base is uh, irreducible and containing the two given curves? Yeah. You, you showed that I can, I can find the base if I don't ask it to be irreducible, right? Because you, yeah, but this, uh, sort of, yeah, that's right. But I mean, uh, you could take the uh, kind of the universal base. You could take uh, mg bar if you want. 
Okay, but if you take the universal uh, family of curves over mg bar, we've shown mg bar is is irreducible. So that. Yeah, but uh, if I want it to be a scheme, I mean, I, I have two curves and I want a family of curves in which the base is a scheme irreducible and the containing yeah, both the curves. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that as well, right? So let's, re let's return to that in the, in the discussion. I only have like one, uh, yeah, I'm basically um, going a little slower than I expected, but I'm about done. I just have, I just wanted to give a, a summary of, of some other arguments. Right, so I wanted to sort of go back in time. You know, what I had just presented was was an argument from '82. Uh, now I want to show sort of how the story started in '69. So there's '69 was an, an incredible year for mathematics, <laughs> and like Deline Mumford's paper and, and Bolton's paper. Um, so I, what I'm, I want to quickly summarize is Deline Mumford's arguments. They gave two different arguments, and and Fulton. And actually something, yeah, I meant to highlight earlier. I mean, this is the paper that introduced was in stacks for the first time. Um, and they used algebraic stacks in some way in their paper, but it, it, it did, it's not actually essential for either of their arguments. Um, but it's really the properness, it's the compactification that's really relevant. And then, oh uh, yeah. Um, and so both papers, interestingly, they, they show that it's it's the ng bar is irreducible um, by in positive characteristic by reducing it to characteristic zero. So they, both of them ultimately relied on either the irreducibility from the Teichmuller uh, argument or this Klepsch Hurwitz argument. And so the so this first argument uh, maybe it's the simplest here just conceptually is that uh, what, what you know what they showed is that ng bar is smooth and proper over spec z. And that alone implies by the following fact that, 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 that if you look at the number of connected components in a fiber, it's constant. And so you can immediately conclude that since mg bar, the fiber over C is connected, you get connectedness of, of, of any fiber. Um, so yeah, yeah, so, and in fact, you know, like if you have a map, okay, if you drop the smoothness assumption and if you just have say proper and flat, then this function is, is lower semi-continuous. It can drop down and in, in, uh, in close subsets or at particular primes in this case. Um, but to get that it's constant, uh, you only need, you don't need smoothness. Having like geometrically normal fibers is enough. So in fact, this argument could have worked if you applied this to the coarse moduli space. Um, right, and their second argument, okay, so that's one argument. Second argument is not too, okay, different. And I'm sure they had many other arguments in mind when they wrote this. Uh, that, yeah, there, there was less available at that time, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, so in the second argument, they, they sort of used the, the boundary divisor as, as we did on, on, in our previous argument. So the idea was, uh, you first show that for any field um, that there doesn't exist any proper connected components of MG. This was actually the hard part, yeah, that, that there's no proper connected components of, of, of MG. And this is the part that used both, uses, I mean, yeah, uses a lot. It uses the existence of coarse moduli spaces. Um, of mg over z, in fact. And they uh, relied on git. But you wouldn't say that their proof like uses, this is not how we, this was not a git construction as, as we would call it today. It appears in Mumford's book, git, but uh, it sort of, he proves this rat without using really uh, that like the Hilbert Mumford criterion and sort of the standard setup that we know as GIT. It's a sort of an ad, ad hoc method using covariance, but, um, and interestingly, actually like 
at that time, this was, this was 1969, um, Mumford's theory of GIT wasn't even known to work in, in positive characteristic. It was only later in like the late 70s that Habush resolved Mumford's conjecture, which allowed it to go through. And then the relative GIT setup wasn't even shown, I wasn't shown a couple of years later until Seshadri. So this was, this is not, yeah, but this, but yeah, so it's using a result in the book. And the point was, um, yeah, the MG, um, and it uses a, a, a compactification. So Mumford also showed that MG was quasi projective. So he, you could just take a projective compactification here. The projectivity is not important though. You could also have, they could have also applied negata compactification to get something proper, which was a result that had been proven also that decade. Anyway, but now, then they use the characteristic zero result. Now X is projective, oh, is projective over Z. And so now you use sort of a similar connectedness uh, result to this, their first argument where you show um, that using the characteristic zero statement that uh, X being connected over the complex numbers implies that X uh, over any finite field is also connected. And then finally, it relied on actually showing that MG itself was not proper. But by using not degenerations of curves, but, but using uh, the degenerations of the Jacobians. And then sort of, the, then they also, yeah, then the next step was to show that there doesn't exist a connected component consisting entirely of smooth curves. So this is, this follows more or less from step one in stable reduction. Uh, and then finally, they, yeah, once the, these two steps, one and two, essentially, yeah, what they do imply, uh, what, our, what, our key proposition, namely that smooth curves degenerate to stable curves. Uh, and then they conclude in a very similar way that, that using the boundary that, uh, yeah, they, 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 con they, they conclude that, that, yeah, they argue that the boundary is connected sort of similar to, but in a little more ad hoc way because they, they, in that paper, they didn't, they, they didn't introduce the end pointed versions of these moduli spaces. They didn't have the gluing maps between them. Um, but the argument is, is essentially, yeah, what is the same. And finally, just to just go very quickly over Fulton's argument in 1969, just to give some historical perspective, uh, his approach was, was not using, he didn't use the, the properness, but he, his strategy was he, he wanted to, to define the Hurwitz scheme. He defines it over Z. And so he showed that our picture that we had over the complex numbers extends to a picture over the integers. And he showed that this map was finite as long as the characteristic was bigger than the genus. It actually fails. Yeah, there's a discussion in that paper. It's just not, it's not finite and low and low characteristic. Um, right, this is the map that takes, you know, a branch cover to C and this to the branch points. And then rather than relying on the properness, he sort of showed that uh, a reduction theorem where he showed that like, since this map is finite in a tau, the connectedness of, a, of the, con the connectedness generically of this Hurwitz space implies it over a finite field. And there's yeah, quite a bit that goes into it, but that's sort of my, yeah, my uh, attempt to summarize it. So I'm gonna st stop the recording now and then we could have a discussion. <laughs>